Welcome back, everybody. Here's the giveaway for today's episode. Free access to the Mind Pump Forum. It's a great forum full of fitness-minded individuals, people who love memes, people who love to debate. Sometimes some crazy stuff goes on in that forum. Anyway, it's a great place to go, and you can get in there for free, but you got to do the following. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment the most, if we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to that forum. Also, we're running a huge sale this month. Check this out, right? Our best fat burning program and one of our best bodybuilding programs are both 50% off. Okay, so the first program is MAPS HIT. That's high intensity interval training done the right way. Most HIT programs are stupid. Ours is not stupid. It's actually phenomenal. That's 50% off. And then we have MAPS SPLIT. It's a traditional bodybuilding split program. Again, excellent programming written by myself and my co-hosts uh, and some bodybuilder friends of ours. So it's a great workout program. That's also 50% off. So you can get both of those half off. If you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use this code. It's special just for YouTube viewers for the 50% off. D-E-C-50. So D, the letter D-E-C, and then again, the number 50 with no space for 50% off either one or both of those programs. All right, here comes the show. All right, here's today's uh, fit tip. Look, if you're trying to burn body fat, everybody knows it's a rule. You have to eat less calories than you burn, right? You have to be in a calorie deficit. But here is a tip that'll make it more effective. Rather than having a consistent deficit all week long, try to have an undulating approach. Some days, larger deficit, other days, smaller deficit, and other days yet still, maybe maintenance or surplus. In fact, studies actually show the undulating approach preserves more muscle tissue, results in a little bit more fat loss, and maintains a higher metabolic rate. Yeah. Was, was that a, a recent study? That was pretty new, wasn't it? Yeah. They, what they did was, in the study, is they gave, there were two groups of people, and these were people who worked out and the whole deal, and they said, okay, you guys over here, 25% calorie reduction or 25% below maintenance, I think it was. And then they said, okay, now you guys over here, it's 35% Monday through Friday, but then Saturday and Sunday, you're going to eat more calories. But at the end of the weeks, the calorie deficits will be the same. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the study, the people, the group that had the larger deficit during the week, but then ate the you know more calories on the weekend, preserved more muscle and had less of a metabolic slowdown and actually burned a little bit more body fat. Doesn't What's, it just seem like more realistic? Yes. Be because, I mean, not everything is so perfectly controlled all the time. Like, we've had to kind of really – I mean, we, this is a new thing. We've created the the ability to, to have access to food like that where we can have the consistency of calories to be met on a daily basis like bro, that. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because – okay, so here's what's funny. Bodybuilding – bro science, oftentimes the way they explain things doesn't make sense, but the reason why they do sit things is because they've seen it work. And bodybuilders for a long time have advocated for refeeds or cheat days, right? Essentially doing what we're talking about where there's a higher calorie deficit and then they'll have a day or two right. with higher calories and they say it works better than that stuff. Now, I always recommended undulating, not for the greater fat loss or muscle preservation because I that wasn't necessarily, and there weren't really studies to support that, but the reason why I did it was for the behavioral effects, like you're saying, because I know that giving people more calorie seed on, on weekends, for example, and maybe less during the week when they're working and they're busy anyway, people were, it was easier for them to stick to it. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you guys think the pros and cons of the strategy are? Because I, I think is in a, in a controlled environment, that this is what the research says. This is what I think we've been recommending for a long time. In fact, that's why I brought up was the study kind of new because I remember we did a video on YouTube. Mm. You and I did a long time ago. Uh, and I think later on, the study came out to prove that that was the better approach of doing it. But I do see some pros and some cons. Do you, do you guys agree or do you think this is the answer and it's just well, the better way? Well, I see some cons in that, it, depending on the client, if uh, the propensity for them to eat in a higher calorie surplus, like if, if that kind of tips them into like a trend, uh, if, if they uh, tend to get sort of, I like hate to binge. use addicted, but like, you know, yeah, they, they get in this binge phase where that's the only thing they're fixated on is that binge day. Yeah. This is why I never called it a uh, cheat day. The term cheat day alone implies that today it's free for all. And then what would happen behaviorally speaking 
is people would be in a calorie deficit. And then the cheat day was a go crazy off the rails, off the wagon mm -hmm. day. And it was so bad that it erased the deficit. And it also encouraged kind of this poor relationship uh, with food. So I never called it that. I always said undulating or I said higher calorie, lower calorie days. I always noticed a, a behavioral benefit because like you said, Justin, it, it mirrors real life. Like if I know Friday I'm going to go out to dinner with my wife, well, I'll make that a higher calorie day, right? If I know Saturday I'm going to my kid's game or if I'm going to enjoy dinner at my mom's house or have friends over, higher calorie days. If it's Monday I'm at work, I'm busy. Well, that, you know, it makes more sense to have a lower cal lower calorie day. Some people will adjust it according to their workouts. I think bodybuilders tend to do it this way. It just made more sense, but if it turns into a restrict binge approach, then it's it's not good. That's the major con that I see. And I, I agree, Justin. I think that it, and it does I think it promotes that a lot actually because I and it you get this really strict six day or five day a week type mm -hmm. of dieting and then you cut loose on Saturday and Sunday. And Saturday and Sunday or one of the those days is not controlled at all. It's just literally this is my quote unquote cheat day. Yeah. And what ends up happening a lot of times is all the calories they were reducing in the week, they end up consuming that over or beyond that, and they're kind of really going nowhere. So I do think there is some value in some people having a very consistent calorie intake that they try and target. Now, what I like to recommend is something similar to what you were kind of saying, Sal, which is I like to give a client, this is our target. But then I, I teach them to have some balance uh, in that, meaning that uh, allowing them some days to have a little bit of overconsuming and then some days to underconsume or meal skip. Like that's how I like to do it is, okay, this is kind of where our, our target is. We want to be here. But then I also want you to be kind of normal about it. And what I mean by that is like, hey, if this is a day when you're not very hungry, uh, you know, I'm not going to force you to get that, hit that calorie intake. Let it be a, a lower calorie day. There, you'll probably be hungrier the next day, but just be mindful of where our target is at and only allow yourself to go up and down that say, you know, 500 calories, depending on the size. Yeah. Of the person. So what I like to do is I would tell somebody we would figure out their, their target, right? So, okay. Your, your body's burning 3000 calories uh, a day. So the goal is, let's say we're doing an aggressive deficit, so the goal is 14,000 calories for the whole week, right? 2,000 calories a day on average, so 1,000 calorie deficit per day. So, okay, 14,000 calories for the week. And then what we'll do is we'll have, rather than doing 2,000 calories every single day, some days will be 1,500 calories, some days will be 2,500 calories, some days maybe even lower or even higher. And I like to give people kind of that undulating approach. And I noticed, again, when people did it that way, it felt they were able to do it longer. It wasn't so monotonous. It worked they were able to work it within going out and enjoying certain foods. But what's also cool now is there's now stu a study that shows that not only does it help some people behaviorally, but physiologically, it seems to preserve muscle mm. and prevent that metabolic adaptation that happens when you diet, which is a nightmare. Like one of the most challenging, and this is why lifting weights or doing resistance training is so important. It's one of the strongest signals you can send your body that'll say, don't slow down your metabolism because we need muscle, we need strength, right? So you do that, but when you cut your calories and it's consistently cut, your body wants to adapt to that. Your, your body's always trying to meet whatever you're taking in calorically. That's kind of a, a main you know, feature of adaptation that we got through evolution. So if you eat 1,500 calories, especially if you're not sending a, a muscle building signal, your body will very quickly figure out a way to only burn 1,500 calories and then you start to get stuck. But that up and down approach with you know the calories uh, and, and you know adjusting macros I think is a so great. So you're just basically staying ahead of the propensity to adapt uh, to that type of uh, just like somewhat like training in terms of like you know adjusting totally. and 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 having your body still have to uh, you know some days be low some days be high and then you know there's more of that. Also, too, is it anything to do with, um, you know, the sensitivity in terms of being able to shuttle and utilize, you know, nutrients more effectively? So, so here's where we're going to get back into the bro science. I don't know if there's a lot of studies to support this, but I will say I've experienced this. And again, bodybuilders have been doing this for years where they'll go, they'll carb cycle and they'll have lower carb days and higher carb days rather than having a consistent number of carbs. Right. And what they notice is when they do the low carb and higher carb days, they get this, you know, they will say that they feel more sensitive to the carbs, they get better pumps, 
And then when they go low carb, they notice that it gets them leaner faster versus just being consistent. I've noticed when I go really low carb for a long time and then bump my carbs, even if the calories are the same, I get this really intense effect from it versus just staying consistent all the time. Did you, did you carb cycle when you competed? I, I loved dieting this way. Okay. When I was training, like I don't eat that way normally. So normally um, I'm more intuitive and I have a more balanced approach to how I eat with proteins, carbs, and fat. Uh, but when I was training and getting ready for shows, uh, carb cycling was one of my favorite ways to just eat. I, and it was because I felt exactly what you're saying. I felt like when I was low carb, yes, it affected my workouts. I didn't feel as strong, um, but I did feel like I leaned out quicker when I was, you know, and of course I'm lower calorie, right? Mm -hmm. When, when, uh, when you're doing it, cause that's really what's happening, right? You cycle the carbs, you're getting lower days. You're basically doing what we're talking about. You're just controlling it through carbohydrates. Um, but I really loved uh, the looking forward to the the high carb day. It was part of the 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 mental game too of just like I know I'm low calorie, low carb right now, and so I can power through the next two two to three days because I know on day four I'm going to get to load my body up and I can look forward to that workout. And so I love to do this, and I had a lot of success both with myself training and dieting this way, and then also with clients that were were doing shows this way. Yeah. I just I love the feel. I of it. love it when studies support old. Bro science. It's just really cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it is. Come, like a study comes out, like, funny. Oh, this actually works. I'm like, oh, that's really well, cool. Well, there's something to be said about I mean, you gotta understand that the this community of people, and this isn't like I think all groups and you have like these alchemists. Yeah. Well, there's I, wisdom. Yeah, yeah they've yeah, been but, they've been yeah. applying and talking to each other and doing things like that. And you know, they it, it's it's unfortunate that we're so quick to talk shit or label it as bro science and like it, it gets this really uh, bad cognitation with it. But the reality of it is these guys, this is who's out there testing it first. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for the the bros going out there and trying all this stuff like that, nobody would be doing the studies to try and support it or disprove it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there's there's a lot of value in these people that have been doing this for years and years and years and, and trying to practice. Well, what happens this. is they'll, they'll say something and they'll say this works and then they'll try to explain how it works and they'll get the explanation wrong. Right even though they see the result of it. So, and then what happened, then this is the part that annoys me. It's like Eastern medicine stuff. Totally. Yeah. And then what really annoys me is that the science people come out and then they, they try to disprove the explanation. Right. Not the result. So like to give you an example, uh, pre-exhausting a muscle group or priming, you know, now we'll even call it priming. So let's say I'm going to do like an old school bodybuilding pre-exhaust. And let's say I have a tough time feeling my chest when I bench press. So the old school bodybuilders, what they would do is they would have you uh, pre exhaust it by doing an isolation movement first, right? Cable flies or something, really squeeze the chest, and then go to the bench press, and then you'll feel your chest more. And then the scientists will come out and be like, oh, yeah, well, with our, you know, our MRI testing or we're, we're testing muscle contraction, actually, there's less activation from the chest, therefore, you're wrong. No, because the person who's doing that notices that their chest grows over time. And the reason why it's happening isn't because of some physiological, you know, more connection, just the fact that they can feel it. Mm -hmm. Now my chest is kind of fatigued. I know how to position my elbows better and do the bench press in a way to feel it more in my chest. And so I'm just pressing more effectively for the goal that I have. So the result at the end of the day is what the people, you know, what the bodybuilders had, had seen. The explanation is often wrong. And we see that with so many, we see this yeah. in wellness too with, you know, uh, adrenal fatigue and the way they explain it. Like the adrenals don't get fatigued, but there is an imbalance of hormones and all that stuff. So it's, I love it when it gets It's the right. unfortunate part about our space is mm -hmm. that we we all care so much about our own egos and, and being more right than the next person that we end up confusing the average person. Mm -hmm. The average person just, <laughs> I just want some help. I just want some good information that I can go and apply to my life to better my life. And all of us fitness experts are so caught up in being more right than the next one or, or being the authority in the space that we're always looking to disprove each other or prove that I, I have more knowledge and information. And it's really unfortunate Dude, because I had the consumer Consumer loses. I had such a great years yep. ago, uh, back when I owned my my training studio. I used to have an acupuncturist in there, so we had offices. People would rent, and there was an acupuncturist in there, and she was really smart, really sharp. She could communicate really well. And I used to also I also I used to also train a lot of Western medicine doctors, surgeons, and anesthesiologists. And my my studio was next to a hospital. And I remember one time we were all in. It's a small studio, so oftentimes. Lots of people will be in there, maybe working with their trainers or people in the offices would be on break, so they'd be hanging out. We'd have these big conversations, right? And so the conversation came up around acupuncture. And 
insurance companies had started to cover acupuncture. So I asked my Western medicine doctor about that. And he kind of scoffed a little bit. And I said, well, you know, why, why is insurance covering it? They're showing that there's some applications and whatever. And he said, yeah, but you know, like where's the evidence for chi and these energy meridians, right? So the, the acupuncturist in there who's an Eastern medicine practitioner is explaining the Chinese medicine, you know, whatever the explanations and the Western medicine doctors like there's no evidence. So then the acupuncturist who was very, very smart and also had a little bit of Western medicine training said, okay, maybe the way that you guys understand the human body, we're not going to find evidence for cheese. But she said, are there cases where we see things like referred pain? For example, I feel pain in my left arm. Sometimes that means what? Heart attack. Mm -hmm. So the CNS, the central nervous system communicates through this wide web of communications, you know, through the body. What if putting the needles in the body changes the way the body communicates pain, which then affects movement, sort of reroutes it, and the, you should have seen the doctor go, "Oh, that makes a lot of sense." Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I, and then my ear, you know, my head's exploding. I'm like, you know what? We get so caught up in the explanation, yeah, that we forget that. Well, let's just see, is it working? If it's working, then okay, that's great. And then we'll go back and see if we can figure out ways that it's working. But don't discredit it just because the explanation doesn't fit your your context of how you know you learn things yeah. speaking of uh, unexplained kind of phenomena and things that are kind of interesting and cool um so you brought up the hadza tribe a few times yeah. and like you know people going down there and kind of seeing you know, um you know like how they live and and why they adapt uh, to running so well and all that kind of stuff well there's this tribe in ecuador that i found out about called the wayorani let me see if i'm seeing that wayorani wayorani tribe uh, that for some reason, uh, like they have no heart cases of heart disease, no case of cancer, no cases of elevated, uh, uh, blood pressure, like no, like no definable, like, um, disease, uh, within their, their tribe that they've found. And the, the weird thing about them is they're the highest density of, of, of six digit, uh, fingers and six digit toes. And it's like, what the fuck? So, how did now? How did you correlate the two of those right there? The, because that's where I started. I started. <laughs> I'm like, whoa! These, this is a, a tribe that has all the six, <laughs> twelve fingers, twelve toes. Weird. And then you you read further on, and they're like, yeah. And we studied them further, and there's like no health problems that they have. What the hell? Does yeah. it say now, Doug? Like what percentage of the people? In yeah. The tribe? Like, is it highest density because there's twenty of them, and there's like actually two people in the tribe that have this? Is that why? <laughs> I didn't dive that. Deep. If it could be like, the case. There's like yeah, two I have no people. idea how many. Are these are, are these digits functional? Yeah, they're fully functional. And and, and again, they, they said that there's some kind of neural pathway that that it is like a program that is like it's a normal program that we have uh you know in our DNA for for six digits. What? It's not just like it's a mutation, but also Well, it doesn't even look that abnormal on that kid right there that's got his hands yeah. up. It you know almost what looks like a normal hand at first glance. For a second it looks weird, and then you have to count and you'd be like, what the hell? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And it's strange. And and so they found like in the again, if you go back in history, like it gets brought up a lot of times with giants. It's associated with giants. Uh, like in biblical times, like Goliath, like as an example, there's all these other examples of uh, six fingered uh, giants and whatnot. But uh, it's interesting because I'm like, what, why this place? W w I mean, some mutation, obviously, that uh, does it have some advantage here. I, like, well, I don't and know. you and you just you just drew your own conclusion as far as the eating and the disease and then the fingers, well, he, right? No, there's no, no, they they went down there and and um, uh, they're the ones that presented that as oh, really? As yeah, they as, to say that there's there's some sort of correlation with their diet that is causing potentially well, they, this I don't mutation. know that they said anything about the diet or it's just the environment or the way that they live or <laughs> what if their life expectancy is like 30 yeah. yeah no heart disease no cancer yeah. you know yeah. it's here's, just here's the oldest person in our tribe he's 30 like, I know <laughs> well, and, and again yeah and to your point like there needs to be more uh, uh, investigation because like again you could you could go based off of like what they say yeah, yeah. but but how do you know like how each but I mean, person died I, I mean it makes total sense why you would see the low disease rate just because they're probably eating from the land I mean they're probably moving a lot and they're yeah. isolated yeah, they they're don't moving, eat a lot they yeah. don't eat a lot because there's not a lot right. of food I'm in sure nature. they're not eating a bunch of processed food and stuff and over consuming to your point they're staying active 
So I could totally see the connection there. I just, the six digit thing is where I was so, lost. So let's speculate. What would yeah. be the evolutionary that advantages? you're so healthy you grow extra limbs? No, no, no. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a trip? <laughs> my body, my body can support an extra finger. Yeah. No, no, no. What would be the evolutionary advantage of having a sixth? I, I was just thinking about you'd be a hell of a climber, maybe. Yeah. Right? What sports would this person have an advantage in? Because uh, it could get in the way of some you'd sports. You'd be a sick ass guitarist, right? Like oh, you'd be yeah. a terrible <laughs> baseball player. Yeah, that's point. too many fingers on the baseball. Like where you're, you're I mean, I don't know, man. You might be able to throw like a, a screwball. Yeah, well, curve you might be able to throw. Yeah, create, oh, create yeah. a new a new throw. Like a new genre. Three, yeah, yeah, three yeah, baseball pitches. Yeah, there. You guys always make fun of me. I know what you are. That shit. Be a great arm wrestler. I, I would imagine oh. get a, like a crazy grip on the outside. I mean, climber for sure. Right? I mean, you you need every you need every finger for climb. Well, although uh, our friend doesn't need all his fingers. You'd be a, a you'd be a great you'd be the a good, ladies yeah. would love you. I don't know why. But, yeah. you know. <laughs> you'd, be a, you'd be a good. He's got tic- more options. That's you'd be a you good could. tickler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Champion tickler. <laughs> Hey, imagine shaking someone's uh, hand. Boogity, boogity. Imagine you do like a full handshake with someone who has a six finger, but the yeah. six fingers on the outside because you grip them like this, and then they just and the last your wrist one they wait, bit. and then they just yeah lock it in. You're like ooh, uh, weird. You know, you know what this reminds me of? Remember that crappy ass movie uh, Waterworld? Yeah, where oh, he evolved with the webbed you know fingers. Yeah, and, and he shit. had he had gills behind his ears. Yes, because he could swim. And don't hit, don't hate on my boy Kevin Costner, man. Why did you say your boy? I'm so into uh, to, uh, his show right now, Yellowstone. Oh, right. he's got another show. It's so good. Yeah, Everybody's talking bro. About he that. plays the same character in every movie. Is this one he's guy? not. He's but I agree with that. He's like uh, uh, he's he's uh, he's like Keanu Reeves. Yes, the same he's, guy. He's definitely yeah. a Keanu Reeves type so of actor. So it's not like Dancing with Wolves because no, he no. He's uh, he, he. I think he does actually. A, I, and I agree with you. He's not up there with you know top actors. But I I think he does a great job. It fits his character in this gr- great great show. Speaking of that, I, there was a random and I had this in my notes to bring up to you guys a long time ago when I first saw it because I had to go and like like you know and sometimes you hear stuff on like like fictional shows. But then they they have some truth to it, and the, I don't know if you guys do this or not. But I'll hear something on a on a fictional show sometimes, and I'm like, is that true? That could be true. Mm. Let me look this up and, and find out more about it. And sure as shit, one of these things that he he talks about on the show is has truth to it that I had no idea about. And there's a part in the show where he's talking about making a name for his ranch that it's so big that they're popular like the the King's Ranch. And there's a ranch called King's Ranch in Texas. Now, where you guys may have heard of it or know this is that's what the Ford trucks are. If you've ever seen like the high-end Ford trucks, it'll have this big emblem on the side. Maybe Doug can pull it up called King. So look up Ford. I don't know. Justin's a Chevy guy. Ford King's Ranch Edition. Ford. And it's like upgraded. It's, you know, like Eddie Bauer, right? It's like an upgraded, but it's actually named after like this really popular massive ranch in Texas. That's how big and uh, and influential in that space this ranch is, is that they actually have a Ford truck that... That is Brandon with him, now, just like is, Harley Davidson does, like that. Like I, I just never knew that there's like a a, a, a farm that has got their name attached to now, Ford. Isn't the F one fifty the number one selling car in America, or or it was for a long time? It has been. I don't know if it is like this year or what it, what it's been, but I know. Yeah, you got to think like half of a middle of America. It's probably one of yeah. the top. Oh yeah, so he's showing the, the farm. The, yeah, see the King's Ranch, oh, the yeah, luxury, nice. luxury, luxury line. They do yeah. the interior. By the way, I had no idea because I'm, I, you know, I haven't had a truck in a long time. One of my first cars was a just a basic pickup, but you go in some of these trucks with four doors, they got more space than a big sedan. They're comfortable as hell. Super spacious, yeah. It's like a, it's pretty crazy. Oh, no, I think Justin and I's GMC has more room than our SUV Rover does. Oh, yeah. It's way more room. Yeah. So like when we go somewhere and I have four people, uh, I'll opt to drive the truck over the Rover yeah, because it's, it's just crazy. way more space. You know, speaking of um, like true stories and stuff like that, how much, is there a, a rule that says that a movie that's based on a true story has to utilize like so much like a like, percentage of be a story. percentage. That's such it, a yeah. funny question because I've thought about this so many times that I've never found yeah, the answer you, to you it. You watch some crazy movie, you know, like a haunted whatever, and it's so, like based on a true story. I like believe, how much? Okay, of it? so I if believe this is based yeah, exactly. So I, I believe that there's barely there's, any. Have you ever noticed that they use different ways to describe it? Sometimes yeah. it's uh, based on of actual events. Sometimes it's based on a true story. Sometimes or, or it's a, a dramatized version. Yeah. So there's yeah. like, and I bet there's categories. On each, like, okay, if there are 
five things that are embellished in here, you can't put it under a true story. It has to be on based on events or something like that. I, I bet there's got to be some sort of a standard that makes you have to title it something different, yeah. right? I hope but even biographies, is. it's like they, it's so selective uh, based off of the person's putting together because you want to put in the best version and story. And so you're going to leave things out that – you know, are probably important, but maybe don't follow along with the dramatization yeah, of it. I, there was a movie, I don't know if you're looking this up, Doug, so I'd really like to see if there if there's a specific percentage that a movie needs to do based, if it says based on a true story. But I remember as a kid, there was a movie that scared the absolute shit out of me. It was called Fire in the Sky. Yeah. And it was these loggers that get mm -hmm. abducted by aliens. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, as a kid, my biggest fear was aliens. I have no idea why. Like Sasquatch and aliens. Those are the two things I watch out for, right? Those are the two things I'm scared Always of. thinking about protecting his butthole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Hold on a second. I get it, dude. I Hold get on a it. Like you're walking through the movie theater, you're like, Ugh. Hold on a second. Sasquatch doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do anything. I don't know. I don't know what goes on in your brain with Sasquatch, but I know, I know aliens, dude, aliens. For some reason, it's always in the butt. But anyway, yeah, I don't know. I was afraid of aliens. I watched this freaking movie and it scared the shit out of me. And then I see it says, based on a true story. Yeah. And I remember I was telling, like, I was so scared. I remember telling my my dad, and I'm like, Dad, I'm like this is a this was a true story, and he goes, No, no, no. Someone told the story, and they made the movie on it. And I was like, What? Yeah. What does that say, Doug? <clears throat> yeah, based on a true story is more of an accurate accounting of the story, though there's probably some dramatic license taken. Based on firsthand accounts of factual events is a story told about the same event from a variety of people. I don't feel like that. Yeah, but there's those. no freaking I don't know regulation. Really, I, it's gotta Nobody be, checks okay, this shit. No, I, no I guess, sure. It's got to be just like uh, PG-13, rated R, NC-17. No way. I don't think that- You don't think so? No, yeah, so that- think You think you just put shit out and say it's based on a true story I and they're like much. loosely based Look it? at all the documentaries on Netflix. I mean, I, come on. I see, do. I think that's even another category, right? Like, I think documentary there's no rules. See? There are no rules. So you said that the the uh, rating of movies, that's an actual agency that has to rate movies. So there's like an actual agency that, I don't remember when it was created. What are you talking about right now? When a movie's rated R, PG-13. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. There's an actual agency that rates movies. And they do it based off like how many F word, if there's an F word in there. There's a standard. Yeah, there is. There's a standard. Which, by the I way, the standard has changed. Yeah. Have you guys watched a PG-13 movie from the 80s? It would never fly. As PG no, I know. It was worse back then, actually. Oh, yeah. Hilarious. No way. I watched a PG-13 or a PG movie with my kids. I'm like, this is not PG. Yeah, I know. What the hell? They're yeah, no, to to your point, though, I think that uh, where it gets sticky is if it's a based off of somebody that's still alive, right? And then they like want to take you to court because they it's painted you in a certain yeah. light and it's like inaccurate. I don't, they might have a case there. I don't know how that works. They probably have them sign something. There has to be. If there's yeah. no rules to it, there's got, they got to have a case if they Bro, do, unless they do sign it we away. We could totally make a movie. You guys, talk about, <laughs> yeah. hey, on true talk events. about making yeah. a movie and some crazy shit. Listen to this stuff that I was listening to today. Okay, the squid, uh, what's this squid? game one called uh, yeah, yeah just called squid, 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 right. squid game I, okay. I almost said squidward you know that it broke <laughs> you know it broke all the netflix records and stuff like that yeah there's a new south korean movie that's okay out. so trip on this though. okay so it set all I have, the I have opinions about that okay so it set all these records right right so I brought you guys heard me before we got on the podcast talking about that Mr. Beast guy. You know why I was looking him up? What? So I didn't know about him before this. Like oh, I know huge, I'm yeah. living yeah, under a rock. I didn't know that this guy who this 85 well, million is not as old, uh, old enough. Yeah, I, I like how he's formal. By the way, Mr. Beast. Well, yeah. it, that's Mister. Yeah. So he made a spoof on Squid Game. It passed the amount of views and watch time on his YouTube channel which is for free, then Squid Game did that. took 10 years to produce and get that movie out there. He made that thing in seven days. Wow. He made a spoof video of Squid Game that took him seven days to produce, and it ended up surpassing the amount of views. Now, of course, that makes total sense when you understand the viewership on YouTube versus the viewership of Netflix. Netflix has somewhere around yeah. 200 million subscribers, and it's like 20 billion. 20 billion or yeah. something ridiculous amount of people that are viewing YouTube. But it's interesting to think about what that could open the door for for Net Netflix and streaming companies. Yeah. I was listening to this podcast and they were talking about, imagine if you were a, a like Netflix, how brilliant it would be to tease one or two episodes of mm -hmm. a series on YouTube for free. It's a much bigger platform yeah, for not? free. It gets people to hooked 
to watch it. And then if you want to finish the series, you got to go over to Netflix and pay the nine ninety nine a month, or maybe they do some sort of an a la carte version. But what an what a brilliant yeah. concept for Netflix to grow their base from two hundred million to get into the billions. Dude, that makes perfect Story sense. Story of Mind Pump recreated by Jake Paul. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be huge, dude. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Dropped into a vat of radioactive material. <laughs> yeah. Justin got superpowers based on true events. Totally true events based on. Yeah, that's what I. That's what I would say. Yeah. It, it is interesting. I feel like that's a, a smart strategy. I'm surprised nobody's already done that. Yeah, right? I yeah, I feel like they would have done that already. Well, you see, um, so is it, I, I think Epics have done it. I think Showtime did it to me. So through I know when I've gone on, on the on the actual platforms, I'll do that. Yeah, they'll Apple give you one episode. That well. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Some, some of them will it. let you watch the first two or three episodes of something and then just enough to get you hooked on it yeah. and then you end up but not on another platform right that's like i think that would be so smart to do or i mean you could you could also make it internally so you don't have to go on another platform what you could do is imagine if netflix offered a free platform so it's netflix free watch the first netflix episode of free series. gives you basically all kinds of uh, episodes like the first couple episodes of their most popular seasons to entice people to potentially go on and then uh, subscribe. It's a brilliant idea. Yeah, that is a really good. You know what right? it reminds me of? The whole like, uh, you know, Mr. Beast getting more views by talking about something than the actual thing itself did. That reminds me of, I remember my econ class in high school. I actually had one good teacher in high school. He was an e economics teacher. And he said the way that you made m millions of dollars or money during the gold rush was not this? So the gold rush is when lots of people the, came the to California pans and, and picks. Yeah, yeah. he yeah. goes. It wasn't the people that All found the, the gold. He goes, There's a few people that made millions with gold. He's like, it was the people selling the, the the picks and the axes and the pans and that kind of the materials. So they basically rode the coattails of this thing, and you had people making tremendous amounts of money servicing people looking the for casinos, gold. The casinos, the brothels, they're all like right there. Yes. Well, I, I feel <laughs> like we're seeing the examples of that right now with this whole metaverse and NFT market. You see people all over the place that are making all kinds of money selling these NFTs that are supposedly going to play a role I think in, in the metaverse. I think your Dude. theory that you said the other day is on point. Yeah. I really do. I think you're so on point. It makes perfect sense that people laundering money are selling digital bullshit to get money. That's been a big part of the art world too, right? With paintings and everything yeah. is just the ways to launder money and, you know, pass things back and forth in the black market. Uh, that was a, a, a way that they could do yeah. that. Speaking of being sneaky, uh, I ha I am now sneakily. Sneakily? Sneakily. Is that a word? <laughs> it is now. Uh, we'll go with it. Yeah. Um, I am. I have it to the library. I'm finding ways to get my daughter to increase her protein and nutrient intake, which yeah. is great. Because she is, unfortunately, she has a, one trait of mine, which is to be counter, uh, you know, authority. So mm, I'm the authority. Yes. If I'm like, oh, you got to try this. It's really good for you. It's not going to happen, right? <laughs> so I got to find ways of whatever, doing this or whatever. Anyway, she's got braces and she's got this work going on and her mouth hurts and so she, she doesn't want to eat lots of, you know, healthy foods and so I'm like, what do I do? I'm like, let me make you, hey, do you want to make a smoothie? She's like, yeah. So I'm like sneaking in. To, <laughs> so I'll make the smoothie yeah. and I'll sneak out the Organifi protein so mm -hmm. she doesn't see it and I'll throw it in there and then she'll drink it and you know she'll go to school and I'll tell Jessica, I'll be like, she's had 30 grams of protein. Just because like, Dude. why? Like she has no idea. <laughs> That's <laughs> perfect. Had, you know? Yeah, we've, we've done some similar with, with waffles. Yeah, I was going to say, you do the pancake and waffle move, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, pancake and waffle. So uh, add protein was was the next thing. Because at first it was like, the we were concerned more with greens and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But now it's like, it's more protein, with especially with Everett, just because um, he's just has this, he just loves carbs, you know. And, he, yeah. and like, I have to like, no, let's get you some protein and, and get after it. And so I've, I've been. Have you guys ever? It. Did you guys ever try the the green pancakes that organifies the the recipe that they have for that? They're, no, they're actually really good. Are they really? Yeah, so because you use the, the green juice. Yeah, the green juice is in there. It gives it kind of like this minty flavor, which I wouldn't think that would be really good. But you put like two or three like chocolate chips inside there, and you have like a mint chocolate chip pancake. It's bomb. Really? Yeah, that and it's a great way to sneak bad. like the, the greens inside there. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. we recently bought these. Uh, uh, waffles that are like dairy and grain free and they're incredible throw some butter on those bad boys and you know what i've been eating with them hmm. chicken have you guys ever so, chicken and yes dude you know so, i've never chicken done, uh, okay. you know i've never done the, so, the fried chicken with the rice so yeah oh, i've, so, I've, I've heard chicago I've, eat that, yeah know. so i've heard chicken and waffles chicken and waffles and i was like is that really good i don't know is it supposed to, it's good chicken and waffles goes great it's just together. like fried i mean fried and paradise. sugar i mean right i mean yeah. of course 
Yeah. That's why like all in what in the South they have all the deep fried Twinkies and deep fried uh-huh. Oreos and like, you know, they take all these like super you know, There's a I, place in South Side Chicago. I, I used to go with some of my friends. Like I went maybe like twice, but like you literally can bring any food item and then they'll dip it and batter it and, and fry it for you. You know you know what I saw? Yeah. I saw this is no joke. Deep and fried I, Twinkie. No. <laughs> yeah, you do anything. No, right? it was deep fried stick of butter. Oh, oh yeah. Wow. We, they took double stuff Oreos. God, that would make dude. your stomach oh, hurt. So now here's the deal. I would totally eat that. You guys know how I am with butter. Deep fried butter? That sounds amazing. So I love butter too, but I, I have a threshold. You don't have a threshold with it? Like I can only eat, like Katrina made this dish for like I'll eat butter dessert. by itself. I'm with you though. I can do that and blocks of cheese. Either yeah. Way. You All can right. go straight. Like So she we made this dish. She made this dessert. I forgot what it was called. It was like a upside down pumpkin cake or something. Something weird I, I'd never seen before. And it had this layer of of butter. Like she literally cut the, the whole top of it was the little cubes of butter on the top of it. And uh, it did taste amazing, but I can only have a very small piece of it because that much butter is it's, it's it, rich. Is just it upsets my stomach, even if I'm doing like Kerrygold, you know, grass fed butter. It still fucks me up if I eat too much butter at once. Oh no! If you if you see me put butter on anything, it's <laughs> it's so I look at butter like it's cheese. Like it's why not put a big slice of butter on the thing? Yeah, and then bite into it. It's the deli- when I was a kid. Amen. Yeah, when I was a kid, my mom would hide the butter because when I was little, she'd come back and she bite bites out of it when I was little. Oh, so well, it's, it's a, a funny life. thing because even to this day, like if you're at a restaurant or something, I'm like just put piling the butter on. Like people will just be concerned, be like, oh, they think like you're gonna have a heart attack or something. Yeah, yeah, like no. Yeah. You know, speaking of kid it. stuff, I was gonna ask you, Sal, because you know your yours is up to the one the one year mark and stuff. Like, are you able to? And do you, does Jessica and you use like those apps that tell you about leaps and changes yeah. that they go through? Yep. So, are you able to to see that coming or know like when you're in a leap or when it's it's, when it's relatively high? accurate? It's yeah. very strange. I know when he goes through a leap, sleep is worse, he's yeah. more clingy. Yeah. Then when he's out of the leap, he's like a different kid. You know, there's like new skills and stuff. Yeah. Are you, and it, it is, you, they still have them from oh yeah no that hasn't i mean he's what two and a half uh two and a half years old and still we have these little growth spurts Mm -hmm. or leaps whatever you want to call them bro you got to tell the story of when you were in bed oh god that's that is so great so this is like okay so i don't know if you told justin no i didn't tell i didn't tell i think i was just talking to you about it but um so lately so he's going through a leap right now and one of the things that happens is like because he like is a great sleeper um, but then there'll be these little moments where like a week will happen where he's just not sleeping great or he's waking up in the middle of the night and he's wide awake. And so, uh, and because he's been also not feeling well, Katrina let him in the bed, uh, the night before last. And you guys, I, we've talked about, I sleep naked, right? So he cra- he comes climbing in and he normally kind of cuddles over with Katrina. Well, he's in this playful mood at three o'clock in the morning, you know, two nights ago, and he's just talking and being funny and, you know, pretending like I'm snoring. He gets in my face. <laughs> and then you go over to Katrina and be like, shh, daddy, shh, daddy. Yeah. Shh. And so he's just being cute. This is in the middle of the night. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah, it's two, three in the morning, and he's being cute and funny, so I can't get mad. And then uh, we, we play this like pretend sleeping game and like the, and I've added to that, right? I've told you guys about this before where I pretend like I'm, I'm snoring and he'll do it. And the newest thing is I'll pretend like I'm snoring and then Katrina will come over and kiss me and I, I get startled and I do that, and he thinks it's the funniest thing. So he's over there and he's, I'm pretending to be sleeping and he's kissing me on the cheek to try and get me to jump and play with him. And I'm like half frustrated because I'm tired of shit, but then also it's so cute and it's funny. Well, so he's messing with me and he normally isn't in the middle of the night and I'm sleeping naked and he's in my face. And as he's messing with me, he, his foot, you know, kicks my junk and (laughs) it it of course makes me kind of scoot back. So Uh, he thinks I'm playing with him. Oh no. And so he's, and he's giggling and he's kicking my dick (laughs) thinking thinking it's the funniest thing ever because, because daddy keeps moving and jumping. Now he has a target. Oh yeah. So he thinks it's the funniest thing ever. And I I sit up and I'm like laughing, but I'm frustrated at the same time. I'm like, Katrina, I'm like, you gotta put this kid to bed. (laughs) It's like, he's kicking me in the dick and he thinks it's hella funny. You revealed his weakness. Oh Oh, dude. Yeah. No, the other day, so Jessica sent me a picture yesterday of uh aurelius so she was changing in the middle of changing his diaper so he's only one right changing his diaper and then she had to leave the room for like a split second so he's you know bottom half naked you know crawling he's in a little little you know caged off area or whatever and she comes back and he's sitting down (laughs) and it's the back of him so she sends a picture it's the back of him with his little butt crack and he's sitting down and he's looking down 
And I'm like, what's he looking at? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> his I know what he's like. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's figured it out right now. <laughs> he, saw, he, saw, he figured it out, yeah. He's sitting, <laughs> he's sitting in the corner. Yeah. And I was cracking up because, you know, you at know first I didn't funny? know. I'm like, what's he doing? What's you know, the funny? funniest thing about Dude, that is, and I don't know how, how it is with you and Jessica or not, but, you know, Katrina is the, the youngest and a girl. So she's like, she's like, will ask me like, is that okay? Is that normal? Is it, should we let him, should we let him? Like, so he gets in the bath, right? He sits in the bath and he's in the similar phase, right? And the water's filling up and he loves to sit down. He like stretches his, his ball sack, you know? And he's, <laughs> he's like, see, the bat wings. yeah, he's yeah. seen how far he can stretch uh, yeah. it. It's that. And Katrina's like, was telling him, Max, no. And I'm like, why are you telling him? No, let him do that. She's like, we, you let him do that. That's, you do that. Yeah. I'm like, of course well, I did all you, that. If you freak him out. Me yeah, yeah, it's not a big deal. Yeah. If you freak him out, then you'll think. Yeah, 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 yeah. So she's she's now anytime he's doing anything, <laughs> is private, it normal? Adam's like, yeah, I do it all the yeah, time. Yeah, when I, think that. I <laughs> yeah, still do. Yeah, it. yeah. yeah. So, 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 that's what but, we do. But it's, it's funny time. when they when he does something like that, and she, and or he'll have like he gets these little little boners, right? And she's just like, is that normal? Do they just get like? It's yeah. like he doesn't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. but yeah, it's total normal. Yeah, and you, and you and you know what? What I had trouble doing is giving like little kid names to body parts. So like you know, oh, don't touch your pee pee or whatever. And yeah. I'm like, no, no, uh -huh. you got to use the real anatomically correct yeah. word because otherwise it kind of stigmatizes right. the whole right. thing. Then he's hanging out with his friends in high school and he's referring to his people. Yeah, or you just think it's, you know, you <laughs> feel know. shameful or weird. I, I mean, yeah. when I was, like, I was raised totally different. When I was a kid, we didn't talk about any of that shit ever. Yeah, yeah. And so I never had that relationship with my parents to do that yeah. kind of stuff. So yeah, I, yeah. I try to be a little different uh, you know, with my same. Kids. Hence, uh, the last podcast where I talked about animal penises. That's yeah. just you know, <laughs> you try to normalize it, yeah. and then you look at something abnormal. You're like, whoa, cool. Uh, that's hilarious, dude. I can't wait until our kids are old enough and listening to these archived episodes. Oh god, right. like, Dad, did he's, you really tell people I was doing the bad at, thing? Uh, You're gonna be like, oh, cringing. We're 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 now. He's now putting words together, right? So like we've he's. He's been saying single words for yeah. a while now. Now we're starting to pair. And one of his first words, the other one out, and it's just, oh my God, he gets me as a dad all the time. Please, daddy. Oh. And it's just like, it's, and he knows it's like this powerful thing now. Please, daddy. It's like, <laughs> oh, bro, how do I say no to that? Dude, dude? Ar Aurelius <laughs> learns, she, he learned how to do this, and they're smart, right? He goes up to Jessica and he whispers in her ear, Mama. And she just whatever, oh yeah. whatever you, <laughs> whatever oh you my want. god, my heart is just melting. And I'm like, oh, you little sh turkey, it's just so good, you know, okay, totally cracks me up. You know what? I wanted to say because you were talking about sleep. Have you guys been able to consistently use the de stress blend from Ned? I haven't. You know, we got the samples. I went. I went through two of the samples that we had. It's I my favorite product. I haven't ordered yet. It's by far my. It's favorite. actually the only product that I haven't ordered uh, after we. It's it, it's. Pal it's uh, like you, it's palpable the effect. Like you take it in about, if you're on an empty stomach, about 30 minutes, if you've eaten maybe an hour, an hour and a half. Now, re remind me the, the, the difference than just the full spectrum. So, what is, so what is inside the de stress that is not in the full spectrum? So, fig full spectrum hemp oil extract is, is lots of different cannabinoids dominated by CBD. So, what you get from that is you get this really kind of the sense of well being. So, if you take Ned's full spectrum, you'll feel it. By the way, one of the, the only, CBD products you'll actually feel. A lot of stuff that's out there is crap. But if you take this, you'll feel it. You feel good. You feel calm but energized. You feel happy, a little bit of euphoria, relaxed, that kind of stuff. De-stress has a much higher amount of CBG. So CBG is a cannabinoid mm. that is very relaxing. Now, it's not like their sleep blend, which will knock you out. Like You do the sleep blend, you're going to sleep. Yeah. De-stress does not knock you out. But it melts you. Like you're just, oh man, I feel so calm and so chill and still. It's like an after work uh, sort of product. Cause I, I, I still am, am hooked on mellow. I mean, that's just my for sleeping, yes. just because it's, uh, I, there's got to be some kind yeah. of deficiency. But like I get the deepest sleep off that. And then I use the, the sleep product more for when I'm traveling and I really need to knock myself yeah. out. But, yeah, the the mellow. I'm just like I get such. Well, they add they add other stuff too. So the de stress also has ashwagandha, which is good for stress. The sleep one has herbs that actually put you to sleep. Yeah, and then mellow. The reason why I think because I noticed that too. 
I think you and it's Adam a usable and, magnets. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I think that a lot of people, especially if you train hard uh, or you're under a lot of stress, your body is depletes. I think its it's magnesium. the stress thing, yeah. And and you'll notice if you get a good form of magnesium, you'll your body will utilize it, and that they put the forms of magnesium now, in there. Now back to the de stress and the CBG because I have questions around that because I remember when we first uh, hooked up with Ned. Um, I remember how much you really liked talking to the guys when we first met the owners and yeah. stuff like that because of how they followed the science. Now, is there motivation behind doing de-stress? Has there been stuff that has uh, come come out about uh, that in particular cannabinoid? Yes. CBG is known as the parent cannabinoid, and it does have this relaxing, calming, not sleepy effect on people. So, And there's lots of stuff coming out on lots of different cannabinoids. So you could probably expect more products where – and by the way, all cannabinoids – work better in the presence of other cannabinoids. So that's why full spectrum is so important. But what you do with the formulations, and here's why we worked with Ned, we've talked to a lot of other companies and they, the people don't know. They, if I know more than you do, and I'm, the, I'm a fitness guy, I'm not a, a cannabinoid scientist, I'm not going to work with you, right? I, you got you to be able to school me. And I know quite a bit, but I'm not, again, a scientist. And they really know their stuff. And so what they'll do is they'll make formulations where it's full spectrum, but there's higher amounts of specific cannabinoids depending on the, what they're trying to get you, your body to do. For example, I predict at some point in the future, there'll be something that's higher in CBC because that's very neuroprotective for the brain. We know the effects of CBD. Everybody's you know familiar with that. There's CBG. Yeah. And then there's other cannabinoids that have interesting effects on the body that I think that they'll put more of that particular cannabinoid, again, in that full spectrum what's, context. Uh, what's all the hype around the Delta-8 uh, strain? Oh, you mean of THC? Yeah. There's Delta-8 and Delta-9. I know that one of them is more psychoactive than the other. I can't remember which one. Mm. Um, and I know that when you eat... THC, your liver converts it to a form of THC that Methyl is longer. Hydroxy something. Yeah, yeah. That, that's longer acting. It's kind of enzyme, yeah. So that's why when you smoke or vape or whatever, you get, you know, you feel the effects, but then it goes away faster versus yeah. when you take an edible and it stays longer. It's just a different form of THC and it just okay. got longer. I, just, I guess it's just gained popularity, but uh, yeah. there's a lot of people claiming yeah. it. No, speaking that's been, of that's been popular for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, speaking of variants, by the way, we got we have to address. <laughs> Ooh, good segue. We have to address the new. We got to freak out the new COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Omni, Omnicron. Tell me what to be it? scared uh, of. Where, where do they get these names? Uh, what is it? Om, Om, Omnicron. Omnicron. Omicron. Oh, Omicron. Omicron. So where, where do the names come from? Greek alphabet. Yeah, Greek. By the yeah. way, they is skipped, that is that they it, skipped the letter. Is that yeah. how the hurricanes? How, how do we get hurricanes names? They're hurricanes, named after people. Yeah. Hur huh. Yeah. Aren't hurricanes, hurricanes named after people? people. Yeah, they, they also go, go in the, alphabetical order, or do they? Though. Yeah, they, yeah they go in alphabetical order. Yeah. So they're named after people, but I know they go in alphabetical order. So this these, is the Greek alphabet. So this is the Greek alphabet. Except we skipped Z, X, I. So we skipped that letter. You guys want to well, guess why, why? Why would we do that? They And they actually said why. They don't why? want to. Because that's the name of the president of China. Uh, is Z? Yeah, he's got that same name. So they're like, oh, we don't want to do this because we don't want to, you know, because uh, no, yeah. I know, yeah. kind of oh, ridiculous. Wow. I know That's a funny. Bit. Yeah, this this new variant is drumming up these uh, fears again and this these new policies. I really hope people start to realize that the, that the old kind of draconian approaches, we can't keep doing that. No. We can't keep doing that. And here's the other thing. There isn't a single virologist or scientist as expert in this field that says that it's going away. It's endemic. Yeah. So we have to figure out how to live with it and we can't keep locking shit down. Yeah. That's not, that's causing so many unintended downstream consequences that are actually becoming worse that we need to stop that. We need to stop that, that policy. Yeah, even we, with people being vaccinated, the variants are emerging. So it's just something that we just got to live with. So now we have to, figure out ways and policies to bring us back to normalcy within the way I we believe, live. I believe most people agree. Like, even when I go, like, we're in, like, the, the worst place, like, when it comes to this shit, right? Like, <laughs> That's all we still talk about. It's still, I mean, everybody else is just partying. Yeah. yeah. It's, if you go somewhere, if you go to another state, it's, like, it's totally, I mean, wait till, I mean, you and I fly out in a, in a week or yeah. two, we head over to Arizona, Arizona. right, is where mm -hmm. we're heading. Watch when we're there. Watch where we're in Arizona and then compare it to just coming back to the grocery store here. Well, I have a buddy that, that moved to Texas. And he was like, bro, it's a different world. Yeah. He's like, it's a totally different world out here. I think the problem is, is that I've, I've talked about this before. If you look at the science and, and you say, if people wear masks, it's going to reduce the spread. If people isolate, it's going to reduce the spread. 
True, true. Mm -hmm. The problem is we're completely disregarding human behavior, which yeah. says this. We could tell people to wear masks all day, don't, all day long. They're not going to use them properly. That's why when they do the comparisons with the states, with the the crazy, you know, with the really strict mask you know, laws versus the ones that don't have them, we don't see that big of a difference. Same thing with the lockdowns. You could tell people to lock down, but what ends up happening, human behavior, is people, if there's higher cases, people naturally avoid crowded areas or they go to more crowded areas depending on what's going on. And that's, again, why you don't see, except here's the big difference. The lockdowns and the mandates destroy economies, small businesses, and cause lots of other unintended consequences. That's why I'm hoping well, people don't fall for that shit again and just say, no, we're cool with that. We'll manage our own precautions. We'll be careful. But we don't need you to shut everybody down and lock all this shit down anymore. Like we can't, we got to stop that. Yeah. So the, I mean, the biggest thing with slowing the spread was that we were, we were hoping that uh, at that point, you know, we keep people safe. You know, we we, we don't overload our, our hospitals and like so it was, it was a volume thing, right? But then you see in other states where it actually kind of passed through pretty quickly and, and people recovered. Or you know, it, unfortunately, we've we've seen a lot of cases where it's like. We try to slow it, but it ends up like making its way through the population regardless yeah. of all these uh, well, procedures. The whole healthcare. So I've had people tell me that. Well, the whole reason for these policies is to not, um, you know, cause too much of a load on the medical system. Right. Right. Meanwhile, we're but laying off people. That's the part exactly. that annoys the shit out of me. Thank you. No, that's not. Tr if that were true, then what we wouldn't we wouldn't have a bunch of nurses and in, in, in healthcare practice who, by the way, were the brave people when this all first started and nobody knew what the hell was going on who still chose to go to work wearing crazy gear and expose themselves to God knows what because at the time we didn't know. Now these same people were like, hey, you don't follow our mandate. You're out, but we need you so bad. Like that doesn't, Jive. None of this jives. So I yeah. hope people are like done. Like, because uh, I, I know I am. Like, oh, we're going to lock everything down. No. You get the middle finger. That's and it. We're done. Sorry, your policies kick are, rocks. Yeah, well, I'll take my own precautions. And I think, you know, in a free country, we should be able to do it. And I think people should be smart. But these crazy, broad, spanning, like, that's like your one trick pony. Like, you're going to keep dropping the same card. Every time another, I find it ironic that that it's very similar to what our podcast is based on. Is that we we talk we talk a lot about this science that's out there related to health and fitness, and then what we do is help people unpack that and apply it to their lives. It's what's happened in this situation is that the science is out there. What uh, you like you said by you know staying in your house locked up with a mask on would obviously lower your chances of getting COVID or spreading it. But the reality of that is that most people's behaviors don't right. align with that. Right. right? And it, it's just, so there's gotta be some sort of practical advice that comes out of this that, okay, mm -hmm. we know what the science supports. We know what's in the best interest of, of everybody to do it. The reality is most people won't do this. Most people won't do that. So, where do we meet in the middle that is the best yes, place for a solution that'll yeah, actually work? Right. Here's yeah. the most obvious example of ignoring human behavior. You got second graders in classrooms in California required to wear masks. You know how hard it is to get a second grader to not to keep their socks on? <laughs> Dude, it's just, it's ridiculous. They're touching their shit all the time and uh, wiping their faces and what it's a waste of time. What are yeah. we, what are you doing making these kids wear masks? It's a complete they pick waste of time. They their nose and fling boogers everybody. It's like, come on, dude. Who are we I had talking to about I here? had to uh, pull Max out of gymnastics because that went that just went live over in our area. So, uh, yeah. we uh yeah, well, I haven't brought that up to you guys, but um so his school not doing it, so they're they're like we're not going to mandate because they. I mean, it's a mandate; it's not a law. So these a lot of these places. I thought a mandate was a law. No, so they they, they have they have the ability to kind of be like, well, we're not going to do it, we're not going to do it, or we're going to or we are going to do it. So it's okay. not like it's a law that they have to, that everybody has to do this. There's a lot of businesses that are just saying we're not going to abide by. Yeah, it. but it's, they could get fined or something. Sure, yeah, right? absolutely. Oh, okay. And so what happened like at our school? This is what happened at our his 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 Montessori school was enough parents came forward and said, listen, yeah. if you get fined, we'll pay for it. We'll pay for it. Yeah. Uh, Katrina offered that. Katrina said, listen, that's the answer right tell there. us what the fine is and if. If no one else will support and help, we'll pay for the fine because we want our kid to still come here, socialize, be be in school. But we sure as shit don't want some adult trying to you know force a mask on him every two minutes when he's when he's pulling it off. And exactly what they said back is like we're not we're not. This is what the this is what a majority of the people that are here are yeah. saying. So we're just going to go with that. But then I had the uh, gymnastics, which was the opposite. With the and the irony of that is the gymnastics is in this massive open area there's like all this space between the Dude, kids so it's even it's, sillier okay here's what blows my mind i know i'm going on a rant here but here's what blows my mind i i would figure people by now would see 
things that are clearly yeah. logical. Like it's too hypocritical to subscribe to. Well, it's like, it's crazy. Like wrestling matches. You know, there are schools that do not let the, the swear to God, you guys can't shake before the match, and then they <laughs> wrestle. Yeah, yeah. What? Explain that. It it makes no sense. It, or you know, it's got to be pe some people that are making these decisions that just think it's a funny practical joke. You got to think that there's some motherfuckers that are just like, you know, what we're gonna do? We're gonna tell people they can't do this, and then behind the scenes, they're laughing about it. To, uh, all the people that abide by it. It's, oh, so it's sad. Ridiculous. Dude. It just shows how easy it is to manipulate how, people in a state of fear. How many? Is it totally is it scare people. And the problem is, we got a lot of cowards. We we, we haven't had hard shit in a long time. Yeah. So what we're left with is a bunch of cowards that get very easily afraid and are like, please tell me what to do, make it go away. And they impose their fears on everybody else, you know, because that's all they know how to it's do. It's really, and then they you have see no those, control. And you see those videos of politicians, like Again, I before the like cameras turn on, no mask. Oh, cameras turn on, put the mask on. It's freaking, it's, it's a I mean, I feel show. like it's, it's I feel show. like it's swinging back though, dude. Even this, this new variant, I actually didn't even know this new variant came out until just like the, yesterday. Like it, the, no one, I don't feel that it's, it's getting the same. They're trying. The news is trying to make well, it scary. The Delta variant was the same though. It started out real slow and then eventually, you know, it caught on and then people got afraid again. It's just, it's this perpetual cycle that the, they're taking advantage yeah, of. Yeah, but I feel like people just are not receiving it the same way that they were before. I feel like when it was, there, was when right. there was a lot more unknown and we didn't have other studies from other countries and more things more information that you could and and understandably so because it is so no that's where i kind of understand some people's reactions and fear sure. on it because there there's one there's tons of misinformation there's tons, tons of conflicting information and there's a lot of unknown so understandably so a lot of people leaned on being more cautious than just being like fuck it and reckless so i understand that but now it's been around long enough we've seen enough shit come out that i believe that more and more people are the the media's narrative is a bunch of bullshit no one tr you just brought this up the other day about how much that's dropping the yeah. the trust in the, in the in the media so i think even though we're, it's the headlines right now I don't get the sense of people in my family or friends or people that I know are like freaking out about another variant. I think they're just like, it hope, is what it is. I hope you're right, dude. Because and, and, by and the remember, way, we're in we're in the fucking worst place here in New York. We're in the heart of you darkness. mean California. Yeah, yeah. here. Yeah. That's what oh, and New York. Yeah, oh, here and, in New York are like Gavin the Newsom's worst. in Cancun right now, just yeah. after dropping <laughs> oh, another mask. By mandate. the way, I, yeah. I want cool. I want to be clear. Uh, for some people, it's very dangerous. It exists. I'm not one of those people that's like it's not real. It's a conspiracy. It's all real. But we're now how many years into it, and it's not going away, yeah. and we have to make the choice we, to accept it. We have to live. And then take respons personal responsibility because these wide-ranging like nets that they're dropping over cities and states and maybe even con the country with these crazy policies, the unintended consequences, the side effects of it are worse, and and they're not working because they're, they're negating human behavior. It's it's almost like, you know, I have like a little cut that's getting infected on my leg and my doctor's like, got to cut the leg off. We got to make yep. sure that that doesn't, you that's know, the answer. doesn't spread. And, you know, I end up an amputee because like, I had- Wait a minute. Can I use like some back tea? Yeah, like, I could have washed know, the science like, Wash it, it first. Maybe put a bandaid on. No, no. Cut the leg off. <laughs> totally. Cool. Hey, real quick. Uh, if you find that you have issues digesting proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, if you want to make sure that you're assimilating those nutrients so they go to the places that you want, your muscles, help your body recover, help your metabolism to speed up. If you're in a bulk and you're finding it's hard to digest all that food that you're eating, try digestive enzymes, but don't just try any digestive enzymes. Work with Masszymes. They actually make digestive enzymes for fitness-minded people. And of course, because you listen to Mind Pump, you get a discount. So head over to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S. Z Y M E S dot com forward slash mind pump and then use the code mind pump ten for ten percent off your order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Wakeman Tyler. What type of def deadlift is better, sumer, sumo, or conventional? Yeah, I like, the, I like sumer. the split stance deadlift. That's the bet. I'm just kidding. I made that up. Ooh. You know, uh, which one's better? I don't know. Depends on who's asking me. Uh, they're both valuable. Uh, I would say they're different exercises. I think that's yeah. the first thing you have to point yeah. out. Yeah, like, I think that the fact that um, that's what I mean. Who's asking me and why they're asking me? Right, what their goal is. Right, yeah, what their like, goal is and what they've been currently doing. All that stuff. Matt, it's a depends answer. Is you're, you're right. Um, I mean, I think, the problem is they have they have deadlift in the name, so people consider that. And because powerlifting competitions allow them to be interchangeable, yeah. people think that they are interchangeable in the sense that one is equal to the other, and what's the difference? 
but they're not. They're they're totally different exercises. Yeah, in yeah. terms of leverage, right? It doesn't it, one feels a little bit more natural than the other? Sometimes for people, I know for me, I probably should have stuck with sumo just in the way that uh, you know it feels in terms of the leverage with it. But uh, they're totally different exercises, is what we need to express. Yeah, they both work the posture of your chain quite a bit. You're going to get some back development. Um, Bodybuilders tend to prefer if they do deadlift conventional. Although in the '90s there was a bodybuilder, Mike Francois, Michael Francois, incredible back. Erector Spinet was huge, and he was a sumo deadlifter. So was Columbo, wasn't he? Columbo was conventional. Oh, he did oh, both then because I know I've seen him do sumo. Yeah, yeah, so but, he, but he, conventional is where he would pull like 700 okay. pounds. But I mean, again, it depends. I like them both. I mean, I like the sumo. For to to feel more in the glutes for some people, although some people feel the glutes more with conventional. I think sumo for some people is easier to learn, especially if you're shorter. Women tend to be able to perform sumo easier in the sense that they get the biomechanics easier than conventional. If you're tall and lanky, yeah. you're built for conventional. And just, you'll see people who can deadlift a lot who are tall and lanky. They tend to stick to conventional because it works better with the leverage. For the average person, I think there's tremendous value in you doing both. Uh, learn both both exercises and you know and the one you you like best or you do the best at make that your staple and then intermittently use the other one i mean that's what i do conventional deadlifting i'm much stronger in i'm better at it i like it more um but i definitely sumo deadlift i just uh, i like to interrupt my deadlifting with sumo deadlifting every now and then and train that way for a, a block. And then I go back to, to conventional because they are different exercises and they both, even though there's carryover to the, the both of them, uh, they have value of, of both being in your routine. Yeah. I, I did conventional for a long time and I got really good at it. And then I remember saying, you know, getting, I kind of hit a plateau. So I wanted to do sumo for a little while, just see if it would break through a plateau. And what I noticed was I had this kind of external, you know, hip abduction weakness, right? My pushing my knees out, staying stable was actually quite hard for me because I hadn't trained sumo for a long time. So I ended up training sumo for a while and got my sumo deadlift within range of my conventional. I think my conventional at the time was 560 or something like that. And I think I got my sumo up to 500. So that's within 60 pounds. But then when I went to my back to my conventional, I did feel really stable in it. And I think it's just because I addressed some of those weaknesses and, and imbalances. So I do think it's important to do both. You could probably favor one uh, over the other. Uh, but I, I also don't think they're interchangeable. I think that they are different enough to where you're going to get different benefits uh, from either one. But they are both you know, posterior chain exercises, glute heavy, hamstring heavy. They're both going to create a lot of tension on the back, you're probably going to get more back activation from conventional than you will from sumo just because of the the leverage. You're more bent over. Um, but both great exercises. And, you know, what makes exercises better or worse, a lot of it depends on the individual, what yeah. they need to work on, what's better for them. Uh, like, for example, we talk about the squat being a great exercise all the time. But if somebody lacks the mobility and the stability to do a squat, it's not a great exercise yet. For them, right? We got to work up to that point. So that's, I think, the key, the key takeaway with this particular question. Next question is from Lore Pat. Do macro split ratios matter? If so, how do I adjust my macros to fit what's right for me? Does he mean like a percentage of protein, percentage of carbs, percentage of that's fat? That's what it sounds like. Yeah, it sounds like that. That's what it sounds like. The, you know, we, didn't we just talk about this recently? Where we, we, I think we addressed this where we said that you know protein is the main one. Right. Uh, the yeah. For most people. Right? Yeah. The percentage of that matters the most. Right. Like exactly. There's always exceptions to the rule if you have some sort of issue with carbohydrates or certain types of foods. But uh, if you are hitting your protein intake, so whatever percentage of your calories uh, is is enough for you to hit whatever you know said grams of protein. Like for example, 200 grams is mine. So however, what percentage that is of how many total calories, that should stay consistent. Then the other two you can manipulate and play with. And I encourage that. I think it's a good idea to try a higher carb uh, intake, a higher percentage for a while, see how your body responds, how your workouts are, how you like it, yep. then go to a, a higher fat and lower carb type of a diet and something in the middle. I think, I, I think with clients, I love to teach – uh, that it, all different ways so they can give me the feedback on what they notice. Well, I like that as like the first introduction, especially as the focus on 
acquiring protein in your diet, if it's something that uh, you don't really see as a coach, like uh, that they're getting enough of it because this is a, a you know essential macronutrient, that and fat. And so a lot of times if you get it from an animal source, you're going to get the combo of both. Uh, and, you know, to then manipulate your carbohydrates based off of, you know, how you feel, energy levels and like uh, where you're at in terms of body fat and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then start to get more serious in terms of like figuring out the percentages and like, you know, really get into it. Uh, as you progress uh, with your with your training and nutrition, yeah, I, I you know um, I think with macros, it's it, it's important to understand that two of the three macros are essential. In other words, you have to eat a certain amount of protein to thrive, and you have to eat a certain amount of fat to thrive. Uh, carbohydrates are not essential. What that means is you can eat zero carbs, and your 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 body's still going to have everything it needs to function and to, and to live. That doesn't mean it's optimal. It just means you don't need to eat carbohydrates. So carbohydrates tend to be the one that people will fluctuate and work with the most. And you tend to trade that with fat so long as your fat intake doesn't go below essential. And then, you know, what you said, Adam, about protein, again, there's always individual variances, but the but generally speaking, studies show high protein is better for building muscle, burning body fat, satiety. So it's one of those macronutrients you want to keep consistent. But this is really different from person to person. Um, I personally do better with a moderate to lower carbohydrate intake. I perform better. I feel better. Higher carbohydrates don't tend to work for me very well. But I do know people where that's the opposite, where they eat more carbs and less fats and they feel really good. I do recommend you go through cycles of, of each one to see how it affects your body and how you feel. Um, I think the only way to really know is kind of move through it, test it out, become aware of the feelings like, okay, if I eat carbs, oh, I got better workouts, but I notice some digestive issues or my fat intake is too high. Um, I just feel lethargic. Some people feel lethargic from too much fat intake. So that's really the big, uh, the big thing. And then of course, overall calories, right? If your calories are right, that'll help with the gaining or losing of weight. That has, that, that has to be a part of the formula. Next question is from Omar MBA one. You often make the distinction between mobility and the traditional end range, passive and static stretches. Do you see any benefit in static stretches? When would they be prescribed over mobility work? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you a huge benefit of static stretching. That we programmed I, them in Prime. But yeah, we, we did. Uh, but I'll tell you an interesting uh, thing that I noticed from static stretching that I used to recommend to some of my clients, and now I'm noticing it even with myself. The way that static stretching works is, so you get into a stretch and you hold it, right? This is traditional stretching. So I'll get in a hamstring stretch and I'll hold it for 30 seconds, some people a minute or longer. And what you'll notice is while you're holding the stretch, the muscle starts to loosen up and lengthen because that's the central nervous system saying we can relax. Uh, we need to not be so tight, allow mm -hmm. this muscle to, in, to in, elongate, right? Now, the benefit of that is it relaxes your central nervous system. Static stretching before bed, and, and now it depends on the person. If I'm dealing with someone who's hypermobile and doesn't have good like strength and stability, I'm not going to have them do any static stretching. But if I'm working with the average person and they have issues with like sleep and stuff, yeah, and they're like tense, do you know 30 minutes of static stretching and watch your CNS just overall calm down and relax. I've been doing this at night and getting better sleep, so that's one interesting benefit from static stretching. Yeah, I like to I like to use static stretches if I've had a really hard workout and I get tight. I feel this tightness throughout the workout and I feel like it's something that I really need to, you know, address at the end of the workout and also why the end of the workout because I'm trying to get into the parasympathetic state. I'm trying to calm everything down yeah. and so uh, to apply something that uh, is more passive versus like active where I'm, you, you know, trying to calm the central nervous system down. I want to start going through that by doing static stretches because it does help you to breathe slower, helps you to kind of like relax in these positions and then form into these positions. So, uh, you know, these muscles can, can calm down. So they're not so tense. Post-workout. This is where it's um, amazing and ideal. I think that I, and I would prefer it even over mobility. And it's not to say that Mobility doesn't work there also and wouldn't uh, have its application. But I just think that's your to your point, Justin, you're trying to calm the central nervous system down. You're trying to relax. You've already had the hard workout. Mm -hmm. Now I want to chill and I want to recover. So to that point, uh, 
before you go to bed, maybe when I'm watching TV at nighttime, I'll get down and just relax and sit in a 90-90. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not actually moving through it. So it's uh, it still has value. I think that the the main thing that we wanted to address with static stretching was that it was it was poorly used in the past, like a, a before like a, a workout. Yeah, like I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, watching TV before you go to bed and after workout. All times when you want to chill out, yeah. relax, be calm, turn and, muscles down. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And, and chill. You saw you would see people doing this, and my biggest pet peeve was coaches that were doing it with athletes before they get ready for a soccer you game. You want to turn muscles up. Yeah, yeah exactly. You're, you're, you're getting ready to have these kids sprint all over a soccer field and you're doing these one minute long, you know, hamstring stretches and holds. It's like, you don't want to calm down right before that. You want them to move better. Yes. So doing something like mobility work far more superior in that situation, but post game or post workout, uh, to relax and still get benefits of stretching, a uh, great time to now, do it. Now, here's where you may see some exceptions to that rule. To of, get into something? Yeah, yeah. like um, let's say I'm working on overhead mobility with a client, and the thing that is really getting in the way is their super tight lats. So it's hard for me to even get them in that position to activate the muscles I want because the lats are so tight. That's a good point. So then what I'll do is a static stretch on the lats, get the lats to chill out, get out of the way, and then I can activate the muscles in that new range of motion to improve uh, mobility. Static stretching also has studies that show that it builds muscle. Now, it's not a great muscle builder, but when you first start doing it, there's this initial muscle building effect you get, then, then you don't Those really are all the same anymore. studies that yoga people like to tout to, to yeah. prove that yoga builds muscle. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> it, it, now, it, 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 you'll build muscle if you're activating and doing all that stuff, but just static stretching by itself has this little short window of muscle building. And what's funny is bodybuilders for a long time, some bodybuilders would advocate for really deep static stretching in between sets or after the workouts. And they notice better pumps and more muscle and that kind of stuff. So there is an interesting, you know, kind of effect there. But yeah, as as far as static stretching being used as a warm up, generally not a great idea. I like it at the end of a workout. And by the way, you mentioned something, Justin, about breathing and calming down. I learned this years ago from a young lady that I worked with who was very, very, she un, she was very knowledgeable on this. And she would see me getting these static stretches and I'd grit my teeth and hold my breath. And, yes. oh, and yes. she's like, do you really think your central nervous system is going to calm down with you tensing up and holding your breath? And I was like, oh, you're totally right. right. She's like, calm everything down and breathe so the CNS is getting lots of signals that say it can relax and allow this muscle to elongate. And it was a game changer for me. Yeah, belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. Like if you're holding this tense position for so long, you're going to keep carrying that stress and it's going to keep perpetuating that. Next question is from E.M. Reyna. What's the difference between sugar and artificial sweeteners on our body? Oh, yeah. I love, I love this. There's always such a debate. So much controversy in our space. This. Okay, big difference. Artificial sweeteners have no calories. Sugar has, uh, you know, four uh, calories per gram, right? So there's calories in sugar, no calories in artificial sweetener. The brain perceives the sweetness in similar ways. In fact, the perception of sweetness is actually stronger with artificial sweeteners. This is why people who drink lots of diet sodas will actually start to prefer the taste of them over sugar sodas because the artificial sweetener actually hits that sweet perception a little bit more um, than sugar. Uh, Now, the big debate is, well, can they help you lose weight? Okay. So earlier in this episode, right, in the intro, we talked about human behavior. Mm -hmm. Here's where, again, we got to apply human behavior. Yes. If you cut 30 grams of sugar at your, out of your diet, replace it with artificial sweeteners and keep everything else exactly the same, you're cutting your calories. You're probably going to lose some weight. Here's why that never happens in real world studies. Nobody accounts for the human behavior aspect of it. When people reduce their sugar through artificial sweeteners, they almost always replace those calories again with other foods. And it's because, again, it encourages that behavior. That sweet, that sweet perception makes you kind of want to eat more. You want it again. You want to seek out more of that novelty. Yeah. And then here's another big one, right? And I remember talking with Adam about this uh, because you know you were a competitor, so you tracked everything so much and- I remember we had this huge discussion about it and it was like this light bulb moment for both of us where, especially for people who are conscious of their physique and their health, sugar has this natural uh, kind of block, right? Like, oh, there's calories. So I can only have one soda because it's 150 calories. So I'll just have one. 
Yeah. Then the same physique, you know, conscious individual will be like, oh, diet soda, zero calories. I'll just drink those all day long. And then they tend to create this dysfunctional pattern because they don't have that that block or that, you know, that speed bump that calories would provide. Now they think it's like free for all because, uh, you know, artificial sweeteners don't have any calories. Do you know when, when were uh, artificial sweeteners invented? Do you remember? 70s? Or I don't know if they're invented, but I know that they hit the market. I think in the 70s, maybe Doug can look me up. It was look like it up. not NutraSweet. What, was, what were the main- Sweet and Low, I think, Sweet was the first one. Like, yeah. I think Aspartame. Aspartame and, was Or no, day. no. There was another one that starts with an S. Not Sucralose. S uh, I don't saccharin. know. Saccharin. Saccharin. I think saccharin was one and of I'm, the first I'm ones. I'm asking because um, are there still some things that are unknown for us? Do you think that we know everything about- Like, Is there been enough time- uh, and studies around it to uh, safely say, oh, it's completely, you know, harmless, and there's nothing else going on. It's just, it's. I don't know. think anything's ever completely harmless. There's still re you know, people still call all the time, you know, and and will call the poison control because they have this weird reaction to artificial sweeteners. So nothing's ever inert. Not even water. You can drink too much water and and kill yourself. There's a lot of debate around it. There's interesting animal studies, but human studies so far show this. They don't help you lose weight. Uh, are there health, negative health effects? Um, I don't know. Probably not, but maybe. Animal studies show some interesting stuff with, with cancer, with some of these artificial sweeteners, but they give them such high doses that it would be super yeah. unlikely for humans to consume. That's always the the, the debate for the person yeah. supporting artificial sweeteners is that and that when they counter somebody who says something negative about them, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, if you looked at the, first of all, their animal studies and the amounts that you would have to drink 50 Cokes in a day to even be come close to what they're talking yeah. about. But it, I, I've just, I've always been curious to, you know, what we know and what we don't know about them. And if they've only been around, you're saying since the seventies or what, what did you find? Wow, well, saccharin was invented way before. Yeah. 1897. Whoa. Now hold on. What was the original? It was it was in an. Ex what were they trying to create? Yeah, so they were looking for new uses for coal tar derivatives. Yeah. <laughs> this was at Johns They've Hopkins so uh, University. Much with oil and tar and yeah, they they make so many different variations. So what were they, they trying this? to do? So, look at this. He forgot to wash his hands before lunch and tasted something sweet on his fingers. This is like the like the Viagra story where they try to invent yeah. a drug for something and they're yeah. like, wait a minute. Yeah. We can make great boners. Yeah, <laughs> we can make this, like, this. Wait a minute, antifreeze has a uh, nice sweet flavor to it. Let's, uh, <laughs> Let's reduce salt. this down yeah. and put it in cereal. Wait, is it saying anything yeah, else? Yeah, it's a fun fact here. Monsanto got its start in 1901 selling saccharin. Why is Monsanto? No, why? I did not know oh, that. There's, a, so there's a really interesting podcast about all this. Uh, had the guy like that investigated like uh, Monsanto and their start and all that. Yeah, and it had like all these different pathways they were able to create a lot of these types of artificial sugar. Sugars, a lot of different types of you know pesticides and all this from um, you know oil products and like like leftover things. Wow. Yeah. Here's another interesting I thing. By 1907, saccharin was already widely used in sodas and canned goods, but most Americans had no idea it was in their food. Mm, that's <laughs> nice. What does it say there about about Teddy Roosevelt? Uh, that guy was. By the way, you ever you ever hear read his story? He's literally the most alpha. He's like Batman. That's There's actually a, based it off. Of ba him, right? Batman was based off of the guy. Yeah. Was he, bro? Uh -huh. No way, really. Yeah. Teddy Roosevelt literally purposely to crime. went to fight in war because he wanted to be on the front lines. Didn't listen to his his orders and went to the front line to fight. He where are those guys? Where are those guys running our country anymore? Dude. Yeah. Such a bad They're out there. Anymore. What's they, his deal they, with they, those humans still exist? I just why don't we vote for those people anymore? Yeah. yeah so what happened was this guy who was the head of the USDA recommended banning saccharin because it's possibly toxic, but it was Teddy Roosevelt that said, no, let's not do this because I'm using it to lose weight. Interesting. So, Oh, wow. <laughs> Inter now, saccharin is, is not really used that much anymore because I think it got a bad rap yeah. for, a for a little while. Well, so it? one thing I want to bring up, so was it in the animal studies where they're talking about the gut flora and it affecting it in any way, or is that just something that a lot of like wellness people kind of brought up? It's, it's, it's controversial. It's yeah. not... Uh, it's not 100% in one way or the other, although okay. you'll, they'll say it is on either side. Sure. Um, like some studies will say, oh, it, it changes the way that your gut microbiome you know, reacts to insulin or it reduces insulin sensitivity or it kills certain bacteria. Then you'll see people say, no, it doesn't. So, I mean, look, here's the deal. Um, you're probably okay having some of it. If, it's, if, it's, if you're trying to lose weight with it, Unless you're 
counting and tracking everything, it's not going to work. The studies show this. Mm -hmm. Simply cutting out sugary foods, but not controlling everything else, what typically happens is you'll replace it with other calories. And it does change your perception to sweetness. It's so strong that if you have lots of artificial sweeteners, you will start to find that you need your food to be sweeter and sweeter for you to perceive it with the same level of sweetness. And this can pose a problem for anybody trying to change their diet or eat healthier. I mean, when you pick up a fruit and it tastes bland because your Diet Coke has rewired how you perceive sweetness, well, that can turn into an issue. So I have personally never used artificial sweeteners as a, as a way to help my clients lose weight. I've yeah. always found it to be super ineffective. The only times I have were with competitors who track the hell out of everything. I Otherwise, I've, I totally stayed away. Look, if you like our information, you'll love mindpumpfree.com. we got lots of free guides that can help you burn body fat, build muscle, improve your fitness and health in, in your longevity. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsalon. Adam is at mindpumpadam. <laughs>